Well, language as a medium of instruction is causing tensions across campuses throughout the nation, particularly in, uh, at University of Pretoria, as well as University of Stellenbosch. So how do we resolve this problem? I'm with Dr. Neo Lakotla Laharamupi to tell us a bit more and share with us his own thoughts on the problem. The way the students approach this issue at the University of Pretoria, what do you think of that and, and Stellenbosch? Because to my mind, they seem to be agitating for English, not the other 10 languages or so. Mm. So have they got it all wrong or is that the way to go? I mean, um, Bratim, they must start somewhere. And that's where they are starting. Because maybe their strategy is, if we can say to the University of Pretoria Management, we want all the nine official languages, it's not going to work. They're starting somewhere. Like at UCT, the roads must fall, they started somewhere. It's not about that stage, they've said it. Now, what, what they're saying with English at UP and at Stellenbosch as well, is that at Stellenbosch in particular, they said that they are, they are teaching in Africans at undergraduate level. And those that pass, to graduate level, they want to teach in English. And the student they're saying, Africans, in that case, is used as a weapon. To exclude. To exclude them. Yeah, yeah. Okay? Mm. Which, is, which is true. Well, and also obvious. I, I listened this weekend, the University of Pretoria students, the issues that we're raising. They're saying, I'm a professor, an African professor speaking, teaching in Africans, and you have Africans speaking uh, students in the class, and you have uh, Batswana, you have Kosas, and, and they don't understand. And Africans uh, speaking students ask the professor in Africans. The Africans professor responds in, Afri in Africans. Yeah. And excludes. The yeah, other. and they don't, they don't hear. And I've used example in this article to say, if my children, who are Batswana speakers, they are in a class with white students who are speaking Africans or English, they're speaking it at home, they're speaking it at school. When a teacher, a white teacher, or a, a, a black teacher is, speak, is teaching Africans or English, when those students in the class do not understand, the white students, they go to the staff room, that teacher is likely to explain in Africans or in English. If my son so, so goes the, there, yeah. he's not, the teacher is not going to explain right, in uh, his okay. language. Let's Let's now go back to part, part of the work that you've done in terms of the education system in South Africa. There it is. The Constitution says education must be provided, must be offered in the official languages. It's not being done. Why? And uh, how do you correct that then? Okay. In the last two pages of this article, I have to <laughs> address the government that we've been voting into power for 20 years. The policies of South African government are so good, but implementation is zero. I've reviewed all the language policy from the time of Professor Bengu in Mandela's government to the current one. They are so good in terms of every child has the right to be taught in his or her mother tongue. It's all there, but it's not implemented. Yeah. So are there, are there lessons from anywhere in the world that we can draw from, that we should be using here in South Africa to improve the situation? The most important lesson for South Africa is in Tanzania. When Julius Nyerere became a president, he said the education system in Tanzania is not going to focus on English or any European language. And he didn't say English must not be taught, but he said an African language must be the heart of the people of Tanzania. President Nyerere wrote in Kiswahili, there are books, if you Google him, you'll find he wrote articles, speeches. He was not speaking to America, he was not speaking to Europe, he was speaking to the Tanzanian people. He wanted them to understand what he's saying about Tanzania, about Africa, South Africa's role, apartheid, so, and all of that. So here in South Africa, if you, we were to put you in charge of the system, where would you start and how would you correct the system then? 
The system has already started to be corrected. The University of KwaZulu Natal in Devon in 1994, I, I use it here, the policy, language policy of the University of KwaZulu Natal, they've implemented a clause which says a student will not graduate without passing Isizulu. Whether you're doing medicine, yeah. you're doing architecture, whatever you're doing, because you know, if you are doing medicine and you don't know how to speak an African language of the people that are going to help and you're an African person, you're not going to be able to diagnose them. Yeah. So that has already started. Wazu Natal is doing it. We need to go and monitor what are the challenges with that, but it's yes. very important. And University of Rhodes University, they are also having is easy closer as part of the curricula. Okay. Now, Pratim, if I can be a minister of African languages, the last two pages of this article, I talk about the NC and I say, what the NC government needs to learn is to learn from the apartheid government. The apartheid government had a language policy unit for apartheid. And that's why Africans is as entrenched as this. There's no African language in South Africa which is entrenched in the education system. We have failed in 22 years the African people who are the majority that votes. Well, quick comment from you. There, there's also a general argument in the public domain that you can't run politics or business in any of the African languages, that it's a sentimental story, this, that people must speak their, their mother tongues, their home languages, you know, but otherwise they, are, they serve no functional, no useful purpose out there in the political and commercial world. I mean, okay, are we saying the Chinese are running the economy of the world in English? They are not. They are running it in Chinese. That's an example. I was in Washington, D.C. for my PhD there. When there's a function at the South African embassy, there are two Chinese that will come from the Chinese embassy. One who's educated in America, who speaks English the way the Americans speak it, and there's one who speaks Chinese from home. Yeah. Every time they talk, I translate to you. And we see it with, with, with presidents. Yeah. That's what happens. Yeah, yeah. Okay. You know? Yeah. That information, when it goes to China, it mustn't go in English. The last example I want to use on this issue, uh, 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 Neil Barnard, he wrote this book, The Spy. This guy was tasked by P.W. Boda from the 1970s yeah, to go yeah. and speak with, uh, yeah. with Madiba in, on Rowan Island. He said, Neil Barnard, when he met Mandela, he has had between 50 to 200 meetings with Nelson Mandela. And he said the first meeting, he said, Mr. Mandela, I have to conduct these meetings in Africans because I need to take notes okay. and I don't want to misinterpret it. P.W. Boda needs this information. And that's, and that's what happened. Okay. Well, we are facing a big mountain to climb in terms of language in South Africa. But then the policies are there. All they're waiting for is uh, implementation. Yeah. Dr. Ramupi, thank you for talking to us here on the program. Much appreciated. I never heard that. And we will continue with the program in a moment.